I came out to my parents when I was 16 years old. My mother, when I told her that I was gay, refused to believe it. Refused. They kept telling me, you know, this is not who you are. You're not allowed to be this way. You know this is wrong. And, you know, my mother was sitting me down and forcing me to study the example of Jesus to understand the role of men in our lives. And at the same time, they weren't letting me, like, hug or kiss my brothers and sisters. The longest I ran away was for a whole week. And um, I just called my mother and she said, where do you want your stuff? Because you're not allowed to come back. I got kicked out of the church. When you get kicked out of them, none of them are allowed to speak to you. So getting kicked out of the church was being like cut off from my whole entire world. There are over 1.8 million to 2.8 million homeless people in the U.S. and the latest estimates suggest that disproportionate numbers of those young people are gay, lesbian, bisexual or transgender. After how many Pride Months, LGBT people, particularly less powerful youth, are still disproportionately likely to be punished rather than protected. And a shocker story in the June 21st issue of The Nation magazine reports that in detention, LGBT youth are more likely to be brutalized by press, by peers and by staff alike than other inmates. We've got with us Daniel Redman. He's a contributor to The Nation magazine. And Gabrielle Prisco, director of the Juvenile Justice Project for the Correctional Association of New York. Let's start with you, Gabrielle, as you're here in the studio. And thanks for joining us. Thank you, Laura. I mean, we go through Pride Month after Pride Month. This is our gesture to say this stuff needs to be covered all year. Yes. Um, talk about what is that route that ends up so many LGBT youth in detention? Why are there disproportionate numbers there? I think that's a great question, Laura, and I think you're right that flag waving is a symbol, but it does not really help young people, most of whom are very much at risk in society and particularly in the detention system. So I think there's a number of intersecting factors. One is schools, that um, there's a criminalization of young people in schools, things that maybe when you and I were in school would have been handled by parents or by a principal or now there are police in school. And for LGBT kids who often face harassment and bullying in school, the consequences can be ratcheted up. And the connection between homelessness and detention? Yeah, also a great question. Well, there is really shocking estimates about the number of young people who are LGBT and homeless. I believe around 40% is the current estimate. And here in New York City, the Mayor's Commission on Homelessness and Youth just uh, issued a report that really talks about this issue and talks about the need for specific specific programs for LGBT young people who might otherwise end up homeless. And I think there's another link through the foster care system mm -hmm. and the juvenile justice system. Let me come back to, let me come to you, Daniel. Your piece, I was scared to sleep, is the pull quote from one of the people that you interviewed. Talk about that person and her story. Um, well, I think that person characterizes what happens to many of the youth in the system. Um, they face a situation where they face a daily drumbeat of abuse from their peers, physical, verbal, sexual abuse. A recent report in the, from the Department of Justice says that uh, LGBT youth are 12 times more likely to report sexual assault in prison than straight youth. And you have a situation where staff either look the other way or even uh, target the youth themselves for brutal treatment. Um, and overall, you have a system that tells an LGBT youth in the juvenile justice system that they deserve it, um, that all these things happening to them, whether to change them or to punish them for something they shouldn't be. Talk about some of the stories that you heard from people that you interviewed or people that the folks at the National Center for Lesbian Rights where you also worked talked to as they compiled their report. Absolutely. Um, well, just taking, for example, the young woman I interviewed for the article, Crystal, uh, she was in the juvenile justice system in Louisiana. and. I think that she went through many of the things that I described here, a, a daily physical abuse from her peers in the facility, uh, staff members who would um, call her homophobic and transphobic names on a daily basis, and two of her friends uh, were sexually assaulted so brutally that they required surgery. Um, she also, and I think this is a very important point to make, uh, was subjected to uh, a course of action to try to change her gender identity um, in the facility. And we've seen examples of this across the country, uh, from places like Louisiana to Pennsylvania, um, 
and everywhere in between. Uh, Gabriel, there's one of the aspects of uh, Daniel's story that talks about the amount of time that LGBT youth in juvenile detention spend in isolation yes. and what that does to their education. It reminded me of you know, so many civil rights struggles where you have yes. not the punisher being put in isolation or punished, but the victim being taken yes. away. Now, the, the authorities often say it's for their protection. I think that, and I thought Daniel did a great point, our uh, job articulating that in the piece, and I think you raise an important point, which is that it mirrors a lot of struggles where, you know, we often hear a lot, it's almost like Orwellian doublespeak. You hear, we have to send kids away for their own protection. Yet what we see happening in the institutions is that kids become hardened, that they're removed, at least in many current manifestations of the juvenile justice system, they're removed from their supports, removed from their communities, from their family, from mental health services, from substance abuse treatment. If they're receiving those treatments in the community, they're often not available inside prisons. You also have kids who are brutalized, not just LGBT kids, but all kids. The Department of Justice here in New York did a two-year investigation and found in four state facilities that kids were having their arms broken, concussions, spiral fractures by guards. And yet, judges, you will often hear them say, we have to send these children away. It's in their best interest. And I think for LGBT kids, the harms are particularly severe. And the use of isolation is often a, tr a quote unquote protective mechanism, even though, uh, as I believe Daniel spoke about, every sort of major institution, like psychiatric, psychological, professional organization has condoned such practices. And this has a terrible impact on, of course, their education. If they're in detention centers that at least have educational facilities, what happens to those young people? Daniel? Um, there's an example of this. There was a case in California of a young man who petitioned to be uh, moved to a different facility or even to be released from his facility uh, because he was put in isolation so many times over such a long period of time that even at 20 years old, he wasn't halfway uh, to finishing his high school education. Um, so I think that the deprivation of educational opportunities is very serious for youth who are put in isolation. And I just to add, um, even with everything that Crystal endured um, in her facility, uh, when she was put in isolation, she was put in isolation for a month at one point, and it was so bad um, that she preferred to be, she preferred to take the risk of being uh, in the general population. Let's play a clip as we turn to talk about how things can change. Yes. Um, one counselor can make a difference. Here's a story from the series Breaking the Silence. Take a look. Like, I want new social workers to see my story. I want people like in social work school to see it. As a young girl, I was often called a tomboy and told that I'd grow out of it. When I was made to wear dresses, I'd throw a fit. They told me I learned to like them. Years later, I still hated them and I still had it grown out of it. My therapist, foster parents, and social worker all rewarded me for acting feminine. But that's all it ever was, acting. One day I was fed up with being called things I didn't even understand. A girl in my class called me a lesbo, and I lost it. I snapped. I don't even remember what happened, or what I did. But it didn't matter, I still wound up in the backseat of a cop car in handcuffs. I landed in juvenile hall. No one cared or bothered to ask why I lashed out. I was considered a danger to society, facing time in California Youth Authority, prison for kids. While in juvie, I was assigned a new social worker. She took the time to listen to me and didn't judge me based on my looks or what was written in my file. That social worker made a lot of difference in Kevin's case. Gabrielle, coming to you, you work with the Corrections Association yes. here in, the United, in New York. Your average correctional facility staff person, how much information do they have? How educated are they about the population they're dealing with? Yeah, that's a great uh, question, Laura. In New York State, we are lucky that the Office of Children and Family Services, which um, runs the youth prison system, has recently issued a guideline to protect LGBT young people, policy and guideline, that my organization, the Correctional Association of New York, and other advocates were really um, instrumental in drafting and implementing. So although a lot remains to be done, New York State is actually a model for the country of having a policy specifically that is given to staff as well as to young people. But it requires more than policy. There's some Absolutely. interesting programs in Missouri that you've talked about. Yes, well the Missouri model is an interesting model and very different from that 
in New York and throughout the country, and that it's a small uh, facility. They are use small facilities. I believe it's no more than 48 beds per sort of unit, and they're home-like settings where young people are allowed to wear their own clothes. They have at least six hours of educational training a day, and aftercare planning begins at admission. Mm. And children, for example, are allowed to go home, and I just want to give a contrast. I was visiting a New York facility. I don't remember which one, and I was told that the young people could have no more than six photos of their family, and I asked the guard why is that? And they said, well, you know, it's storage. And I believe he might have said something about security, but we can't store children's photos. They come in and out of here. And I just thought, you don't know, allow a child pictures of their family. Daniel, how do we get to a situation where even a home style correctional facility doesn't emulate or doesn't mimic the home lives of some of the people like uh, the person at the top of our show today? Well, I, I mean, I think the key, the three key things that we need in the system in order to make any type of uh, any type of juvenile justice system, uh, making sure that the policies are in place from the top down, saying LGBT youth must be treated with respect and dignity, um, and regardless of what staff members may think of gay or trans youth. Um, so that's key uh, training for staff members so that they understand the context um, that these youth are coming from. Daniel, back to you. Your recommendations based on what you've studied. Um, we need formal top-down policies mandating respect and dignity for LGBT youth. We need trainings uh, telling staff members how to properly care for LGBT youth and so they understand the context they're coming from. And we need to end the mass incarceration of youth in this country. We incarcerate more people than China or Russia. Daniel Redmond's article can be found in the June 21st issue of The Nation magazine. We'll put a link at our website. Gabrielle Prisco, thanks for coming in as Thank well. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you both. There's more coming up. Stay tuned.